Now our second presenter will be Zoe Hitzig. Is that, is that all right? Um, Zoe is a PhD student in economics at Harvard and has previously done degrees at Harvard and at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's also a woman of many talents. So, uh, in fact, if you Google her name, what will pop up first is that uh, she's actually a quite well-known poet and has uh, her, her poems distributed in the New York, along with her New York books and other places. And she will tell us about the optimal matching funds for public goods. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so I'll be talking today about a mechanism for funding public goods through a mixture of centralized and decentralized funding, which is based on joint work with Glenn and also Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum. And I just want to say I'm very happy to be sandwiched between Devin and Nicole because I think that open source is one of the best possible applications of some of the ideas around this mechanism. And also, this is closely related to the spirit of quadratic voting, which you'll hear more about from Nicole. I also want to note that, as has been mentioned a few times today, the idea of a mechanism can often be quite abstract and requires a lot of filling in of details in order to make it practicable in some fundamental way. And so I just want to note that there are lots of ways to understand this mechanism that I'll be presenting today. And I think, in fact, the authors of the uh, paper in which it was proposed each have their own idea of how they see this mechanism fitting into some broader theory. I think you'll hear from Glenn tomorrow about how he sees this mechanism fitting into a new political economy for increasing returns. And if Vitalik were here, he could tell you about how this mechanism has informed his thinking about governance on the blockchain. So I want to offer just one particular angle, um, one sort of way into understanding the economic logic of this mechanism and its range of potential applications. And I'm going to do that by drawing on an idea which is probably familiar to many of you, which is the idea of a matching fund. And so I'll start with uh, just a brief um, telling episode from the history of matching funds in the US and then focus the rest of the presentation on the core economic theory of the idea, though it won't be too theoretical. So the first recorded use of a matching fund in the US to, to fund a public good was actually to found the first public hospital in the nation. Um, that is the Pennsylvania Hospital. The year was 1751, and Philadelphia was the fastest growing city in the 13 colonies. This explosion in population made the city a breeding ground for death and disease. A small community of concerned citizens got together and drew up a petition, which they brought to the Pennsylvania Assembly, which was the governing body of the colony at the time, asking for the funds from the treasury to set up a public hospital in which anyone could receive care entirely free of charge. This proposal was immediately struck down by the Pennsylvania Assembly. Met with, it was especially met with vehement resistance from um, assembly members who represented rural districts in Pennsylvania, because these assembly members said, this hospital is only going to service the people who live in the city. I don't see why we need to uh, dedicate treasury funds to this kind of public good. But luckily, the public hospital had one very influential supporter in the Pennsylvania Assembly, and that was one Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin came up with a clever solution to get around uh, this political logjam. What he, what he proposed was essentially a matching fund. He said to the Pennsylvania Assembly, if I can raise 2,000 pounds from private citizens, surely the treasury can match that 2,000 pounds, which was a large sum at the time, um, with 2,000 pounds from uh, the treasury uh, funds. And amazingly, the Pennsylvania Assembly agreed to this deal, and Franklin quickly raised the funds and actually raised more than he needed. And just four years later, the first um, public hospital in the nation was built. And reflecting on his clever politicking, 
Ben Franklin once said, I do not remember any of my political maneuvers, the success of which gave me at the time more pleasure. Um, so I start with this vignette because I think that it's, it really shows that I think ben, ben Franklin was kind of onto something. What he had noted was these sort of two fundamental problems with funding public goods, and especially with funding public goods that are of a high degree of value to small communities or public goods that are kind of new in some way, such as a public hospital um, in the colonies in 1751. So it's well known that it's hard to f fund public goods through purely private contributions, as Devin was just talking about before. Free rider problems make this, these sorts of systems very difficult to sustain. And it can also be hard to fund public goods through entirely centralized funding, even if there's a representative government or a, a dedicated philanthropist. These sorts of systems can often be poorly attuned to community needs. And so matching funds, as Ben Franklin intuitive, are a really appealing solution for funding public goods. They allow this centralized mechanism to harness decentralized information. They can make philanthropic government or government funding more efficient. And we see matching funds in various guises today. They're not particularly widespread, but we do have matching funds in campaign finance um, and charitable giving, and also in some sense um, tax deductions for charitable donations are in some sense a federal matching fund. So why aren't they more widespread if they're such a, an ingenious solution to funding public goods and getting around the free rider problem on the one hand and the problems with representative democracies on the other hand? I think it's probably because they present a lot of design questions. Which goods should receive matched funds? What ratio should be used to match the funds? Ben Franklin had a very simple idea, which was just matching one to one with the treasury and private citizens. Um, but you could imagine that uh, a central body would want to fund it in some higher ratio. Also, how do budget constraints influence uh, the choice or design of a matching fund? To give an example of how many design questions these uh, matching funds raise, I'll give the example of um, the New York City campaign finance system right now, which has actually been a pioneer in the use of matching funds. They have matching funds for four of their city elections, for mayor, public advocate, bureau pre borough president, and city council. And I don't really need to go through this table. All I want to... Uh, highlight here is that it's kind of complicated. Um, the match rate in 2019 is 8 to 1, and there are all kinds of other things that are specified here. The maximum available funds for a particular election, the contribution limits, maximum matchable per contributor. There's lots to figure out. And in fact, you can see they recently changed their rules. And in 2018, they had a totally different system. And I don't actually know all that much about the inner workings of the New York City Campaign Finance Board, but I would imagine that something happened with, these, with this set of rules where they maybe went over their budget or realized that someone you know, had undue influence or they hadn't thought of a particular rule. The point is, it can get pretty complicated. So one way of understanding uh, this mechanism, which I'll be talking about, um, which was initially proposed in a paper um, written in the fall, is as presenting a kind of optimal design for a matching fund that allows some central body to set up a fund that kind of takes care of all of these difficult design questions. We think that this um, mechanism allows for the funding of public goods that um, satisfies a number of uh, appealing properties, like it's sustainable in many ways, it's flexible, it's non-hierarchical, and it's much more accurately attuned to citizen preferences than things like um, 
representative democracies might be. So in order to explain the sense in which our uh, mechanism is optimal, I need to introduce a little bit of economic theory, which is really pretty simple. Um, and it will help illustrate the sort of failures of private contributions and show the benefits of our mechanism in contrast. So this is a really standard, straightforward setup of a public goods problem um, as sort of presented in a classic paper by Samuelson in 1954. We can imagine we have individuals who are each making contributions to some set of public goods. All of these individuals derive some utility from those goods. And what we're thinking about as a social planner is how do we maximize social welfare? Uh, Samuelson showed in a very sort of straightforward um, 1950s economics paper kind of way that maximizing total social welfare in this setting requires that the, marginal the total marginal value derived from this public good should be equal to one. And I imagine for those of you economists in the room, this is totally trivial, and maybe those of you who um, uh, don't immediately see the significance of this, maybe um, it will become a bit clearer as we go on. So why exactly in this framework do purely private contributions fail? What, how can we represent the free rider problem in economic theory? Well, one way of doing it is to simply represent the total funding received by a mechanism as the sum of individual contributions. And what we can see through some, again, very straightforward derivations is that this sort of system leads to the, a single citizen's marginal value being equal to one. In this setting, generically, there will be underfunding of public goods um, on average. So our mechanism, which we're calling the quadratic finance mechanism and has also been called in other settings as the liberal radical mechanism, and Glenn can tell you why um, he likes that name. Um, <laughs> Our mechanism is essentially, essentially defines the funding levels as follows. The funding for each public good, P, this FP here, is equal to the square of the sum of the square roots of the individual contributions. Now that looks a bit abstract, and I'll show you a graphic in a moment. But the real headline result here, and why this mechanism is, we think, really worth exploring, is that maximization of total social welfare gives perfect optimality. That is, the total marginal value derived from the good equals one. And I really want to underscore this because I haven't been, you know, I could go through many different possible solutions to uh, the public goods problem, most of which do not yield this optimality. So this is really a kind of special property um, of this particular mechanism. So here's one way of visualizing how this works. You can imagine these uh, ovals are individuals who are contributing to goods X, Y, and Z. And um, each of them make their decisions. And then the solid amounts are the uh, contributions by individuals. And then the shaded amounts are the, the match from the central body. And something to note from this picture is you see that when a public good only receives a, a single um, contribution, then that public good gets no matched funds. So that's essentially saying that if there's only one individual who's going to derive value from it, then, then it doesn't get any support from the central body. And so I think this visual can sort of help to show the intuition for how this, uh, how this mechanism would start to fund um, an entire flexible ecosystem of public goods. So you might have noticed one problem from the last picture, which is that depending on you know, you know, how much money everyone has and how much they care about different goods, 
We can imagine the instephesis, the amount that the central body has to dedicate, getting arbitrarily large. And that's probably a problem because no one can finance arbitrarily large deficits. And so we have a modification of the basic uh, mechanism, which we're calling the capital constrained quadratic finance mechanism, which essentially is, is a mixture of the pure quadratic finance mechanism and l purely linear contributions. And so you choose some parameter alpha with alpha between uh, zero and one. And this alpha can be essentially chosen to exactly exhaust um, a government or ph philanthropic budget. And so in this setting, we don't get perfect efficiency because we have to take into account this budget. But we do get an interesting result, which we think is an improvement on many existing systems nonetheless. And this result is that the uh, total marginal value derived from the good is going to be approximately 1 over alpha. And I should say, and I didn't say this when I started presenting the theory of this, um, there are tons of assumptions which we can get into. Um, including we're assuming quasi-linear utility and independent private values. Um, and we can talk about those uh, offline. So there are many things that are appealing about uh, capital-constrained quadratic finance in theory. For one, it's feasible. Um, this, it can be used for any fixed budget. It's individually rational. It improves efficiency over purely private contributions. And also, interestingly, it's totally neutral across goods in the sense that funding will be um, underfunded by the same amount for all goods, which uh, aligns with the logic of Atkins and Stiglitz for those public economists in the room who might be interested in that. Um, and I lost my slides. Thank you, <laughs> the tech person. <laughs> um, so we think quadratic finance can be adapted to a variety of domains. And what I think is really important to stress is all the domains in which it might be adapted. And um, I'd be happy to talk about these more in the questions and answers, is that in all of these settings, community values really matter. So I have two pictures on this slide that might um, seem like an odd juxtaposition, which they are indeed. And one is Jeff Be Bezos holding the, his dear Washington Post. And it's amazing that we have philanthropists who are willing to um, promote and support uh, media in this country. But also there's some sense in which, you know, thinking about how Bezos has been able to support the Washington Post makes us think about other counterfactuals and ways in which other media outlets aren't able to flourish because they don't have the support of one philanthropist um, who managed to take an interest in them. And on the other side, I have Jane Jacobs, a pioneering urban theorist who we think her ideas really align pretty closely with how this quadratic finance mechanism might end up working to fund local public goods um, and municipal public projects because her central ethos was that communities should be able to be empowered to make the decisions um, about how funds are used. And um, so she sort of had in mind this mixture of centralized and decentralized funding. Um, so I'll just wrap up here with making a, some broad comments about how Quadratic, the theoretical virtues of the quadratic finance mechanism really kind of align nicely with community values in a number of different ways. And something that um, has come up in a number of the different talks today is thinking about how to really translate between the abstract concepts that are nice to talk about in economic theory, like efficiency and so on, and you know, we really need to think about how exactly those nice properties of a mechanism actually align with what we're trying to achieve in different settings. And so 
what I think is most appealing about quadratic finance, especially as we might understand it as a kind of mode of optimal matching funds, is that it's highly democratic, it allows for community-driven support, it allows for flexibility and innovation, and insofar as we care about decentralization, which we might in settings like urban settings and so on, um, it improves funding relative to purely private contributions. Um, and so I'll end with that. And there are many open questions, and you can ask me about the you can ask me questions about the open questions as well. Questions? Where do we start? Maybe close to the to the mic. Okay. <coughs> So I have two questions. One is a bit more specific, and one kind of has to do with one of those things. Uh, the first one is a bit technical, but I think important, especially for urban projects. I wonder how you deal with lumpy investments. So you know, what if you need a minimum amount committed to this project for it to get done? So that's that's one question. And then the the other question is yeah about distributed considerations. To what extent? Do we think that this mechanism can help, say, lower income neighborhoods get things done in their neighborhoods compared to the status quo? Thank you. Um, so on the first question, I think you're absolutely right that when, uh, when actually implementing this idea in particular settings, we'll have to think, or the designer will have to think very clearly about how exactly um, to deal with cases where um, in, some, there may, in some sense people would want to pull out if a certain funding amount wasn't achieved. And I think that that actually gets to something which has not, what, which I didn't discuss at all today, which is about the timing of the mechanism. And I think in some ways um, thinking about how this mechanism could be implemented over a particular time horizon would actually allow for uh, some of those issues to be dealt with. Like say there's some window of time during which uh, contributions are kind of seen as conditional and then you know, individuals could sort of see the final amounts received and, and make, a, um, make a decision about whether they still want to maintain their pledge uh, before the window closes or something. So I think that, that those issues are certainly worth thinking about and um, are, are I, as I see them, really about the timing issues of the mechanism. Um, and on the, on the topic of distribution, um, I certainly think that there are ways to make this mechanism more uh, sensitive in some sense to distributive considerations. And uh, I think that most of, the anal most of the analysis that we've done so far has assumed that, has basically assumed away distributive concerns and it's certainly a topic for future work to think about how to make sure that um, if this were implemented th that no pre-existing inequalities would be somehow exacerbated by the mechanism and hopefully would actually be ameliorated. But thank you for raising that. Um, maybe maybe we'll take one more question and then uh, save the others for, for the after the last session because uh, I think it's going to be quite related, but uh, in some ways. But I think that will be. Okay. Yeah. Someone okay. Great. Yeah, over there. Okay. <laughs> over there. Someone. Zoe, if I can ask a question and also make a comment. The first question is: most of us think of public. Of, most of us think of public goods as roads bridges, armies? Do we need matching funds in that subset of public goods, which is different from the Pennsylvania hospital? Is there something here, is there a distinction? Question. Oh, that's the question. That's or do you want to do your comment first? No. Okay. 
Um, I think there are some public goods which it's, it's uh, more pressing to address than others. For example, I think open source software is a great example where there aren't existing mechanisms for creating the required funding. And I, th I mean, I think of public goods in quite a broad sense. I mean, there's the economist definition of non-excludability and non-rival non-rivalry, but I mean, you could also think of public goods as essentially anything that uh, generates increasing returns. Um, <laughs> and, you know, how do we fund those activities that are really hard to, um, really hard to fund and don't, ca cannot be decided in some representative uh, democratic way? Second, my comment related to the last part of what you said about the need to go beyond just words about efficiency to showing how mechanisms satisfy formal properties. Because I think this has been missing today. Let me just make it and give it a, an example. This talk today has been a lot about uh, pulling people together, coming up with correct community decisions, particularly centralization and decentralization. I was trained in a way that isn't taught anymore to think deductively from axioms. Now, let me give an example of a result which helps with many of the things we talked about. I'll make it simple. Let us define unbiased political representation as the following. Since 91% of Americans, according to the Pew Foundation, feel that Washington is completely biased, favors special interest groups, etc., what would it mean to have unbiased? political representation. It would mean, let me give an example, that what happens in Washington. Is that a question? The, yes, no, I was going to make a comment of it, but yeah. actually, we can put it off to later. Yeah, yeah no, let's, let's come to later, maybe. No, I that's fine. Yeah, we'll do it later on. There's no problem. But your point about that, going beyond and looking at the optimality of the mechanism, I think is important. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much.